Today we will be covering some of the anatomical doubts. First one, intermediate mesoderm is the precursor of. Now the answer is urogenital system. When fertilization happens, there is rapid growth of the zygote from 2, 4, 8 cells, the morula, the blastula, which is a bilaminar disc, and then forms the gastrula, which is a tri uh, trilaminar disc. So, gastrulation is an important phase where uh, the stem cells differentiate into three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So, this is the gastrula. It is lined by the uh, blue cells which are the ectodermal cells, the yellow cells which are the endodermal cells and in between these two there is rapid growth of cells which form the mesoderm. Now if we take a cross section from this area we will get this image. Hmm? This is the ectoderm, the blue one, the endoderm and in between the cells they have divided to give rise to the mesoderm. Now the mesodermal cells arrange themselves into four regions the central region which is called the notochord. Then on either sides of the notochord is the paraaxial mesoderm. Then on either side of the paraaxial mesoderm is the intermediate mesoderm and on the most lateral aspect is the lateral mesoderm. Now each part this is the same picture I mean same thing the notochord, the, in, uh, the paraaxial, the intermediate and the lateral mesoderm. Now each of these develop into different, uh, different parts or organs because the mesoderm is responsible for the formation of skeletal, muscular, excretory, circulatory system, lymphatic and the reproductive system. So they are developing from different parts of this mesoderm. The intermediate mesoderm is giving rise to the urogenital system which includes the gonads, the ducts and the accessory glands. The paraaxial is giving rise to muscles of the head, the striatal skeletal muscles of the trunk and the limbs, uh, the dermis, the connective tissue and the lateral mesoderm is giving rise to connective tissue and the muscles of the viscera, the heart, the blood and lymphatic cells, the spleen and the suprarenal cortex. All right. Now next question. Which of the following is least related to the parotid gland? The internal carotid artery, the external carotid artery, the neck of the condyle or the seventh cranial nerve. So let's look at this picture. Here we see that the parotid gland is lying between the external, uh, external acoustic meters and the ramus of the mandible. This is the ramus of the mandible. In between lies the parotid gland, right? Uh, the gland is overlapping all these structures, all right? So, and anteriorly even the masseter muscle is being overlapped. So, if you see this is the posterior border of the ramus and this is the neck of the condyle. So, the anterior surface of the uh, parotid gland is actually uh, closely related to the neck of the condyle. Okay. Now, the second is the seventh nerve. Now, we know that the facial nerve divides the parotid gland into the superficial and deep part. All right. So, then we also know that the external carotid artery enters the deep part of the um, uh, parotid gland and uh, divides into its terminal branches, superficial, temporal and post, uh, posterior auricular branches. Okay, so the only thing left is the internal carotid artery. If we see this cross section, we see the internal carotid artery over here, which is outside the parotid gland. So, the option A is the most correct option. Now, next question is, lacrimation is affected when facial nerve injury occurs at which level? The level of the geniculate ganglion, or the sphino or pterygopalatine ganglion, both A and B, or foramen spinosum. Now, the answer is both the ganglions. Let us see how. Before we go further, we first need to understand that the facial nerve is a mixed nerve. It carries taste sensation um, to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. 
it carries preganglionic secretomotor fibers to the lacrimal gland the submandibular and the sublingual gland and it also causes ca carries motor um, fibers to the uh, to the muscles of facial expression all right so um, like now if over here if we see this is the pons and this is the medulla and uh, there are various nuclei the nucleus tractus solitarius the motor nucleus of uh, and the uh, nucleus uh, salivatory lacrimatory nucleus so all these nuclei are giving branches and here is forming the complete facial nerve just like here okay it's forming the complete facial nerve it enters um, into the internal acoustic meatus and reaches the geniculate ganglion all right now from the geniculate ganglion it exits uh, in the form of uh, greater petrosal nerve and it uh, gets out of the cranium through the less uh, foramen lacrim and it carries preganglionic secretomotor fibers to the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion here it synapses and it forms the uh, uh secretomotor fibers postganglionic secretomotor fibers to the lacrimal gland so if there is injury at the geniculate ganglion the preganglionic sympathetic parasympathetic fibers are affected and if it is at the level of the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion then postganglionic uh, secretomotor fibers are affected in either cases the lacrimation will be affected all right the facial nerve also continues from here from the geniculate ganglion into the tympanic cavity or the middle ear cavity and gives rise to nerve to strapedius which will give uh, uh, you know which will dampen the uh, strapedius muscle and um, also it gives uh, these branches um, uh, the post ganglion preganglionic uh, parasympathetic secretomotor fibers which will synapse at the submandibular ganglion and the postganglionic fibers will uh, cause salivation in submandibular and sublingual glands also the uh, part of the uh, the cauda tympani branch uh, which carries special taste sensation will uh, you know combine with the lingual nerve and it will exit here along with the lingual nerve it will travel and it will supply the Uh, taste sensation to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Okay, rest of it continues down and exits through the stylomastoid foramen, and here is the extracranial uh, course of the nerve where all the muscles uh, of facial expression are supplied. Okay, so now depending on at which level the injury has occurred, the loss of uh, function happens accordingly. so here you know uh, from where the nuclei give all these fibers to the level of the geniculate ganglion till here if anything happens uh, you know say uh, uh, at the level of the internal auditory meatus which is over here before it enters the geniculate ganglion it is in the internal auditory canal so if that happens and all the functions of the facial nerve that is uh, lacrimation the strapedial reflex the tastes uh, uh, and salivation of the uh, yeah and uh, and the salivation from submandibular and sublingual glands and paralysis of muscles of facial expression all of it is affected now suppose the injury occurs after the geniculate ganglion then geniculate ganglion is providing to the lacrimal gland so except for the lacrimal function all the other functions are going to be affected and if the injury happens after it comes out of the stylomastoid foramen then only the paralysis of the facial expression muscles will occur so depending on where the injury has happened the functions of the nerve are affected now next question is what type of epithelium lines the collective uh, collecting duct and tubules of the salivary gland now the uh, unit of the salivary its functional unit of the salivary gland is called the salivorn okay it comprises of these acini which can be the serous or it can be mucus okay 
and uh, these will produce their secretions, the serous secretion or the mucus secretions. The, there are these uh, myoepithelial cells which will cause contraction of these uh, SNR cells to propel the fluid that they have produced uh, deeper into the duct, right? So then the, the duct is lined by the intercalated duct. These are simple short cuboidal, uh, cuboidal cells. Then the, uh, you know, the fluid over here that is produced is hypotonic, uh, no sorry, is isotonic, is isotonic. But when it moves through the striated ducts, which is lined by columnar cells with lot of striations, these uh, will, uh, you know, reabsorb all the sodium and chloride from the um, hypo, uh, from the isotonic fluid produced here and make the saliva Ice, uh, hypotonic okay so now here it was isotonic then here it became hypotonic because of the reabsorption of sodium and chloride uh, ions and then uh, it goes into the collecting or the excretory drugs which are lined by tall columnar epithelial cells and uh, or uh, they are uh, also uh, sometimes called pseudo stratified columnar epithelium all right so this is how the uh, fluid uh, or the saliva moves from the SNR cells through the intercalated then into the striated first it is uh, isotonic then it becomes hypotonic and then it is excreted okay now the next question is do bones of the calvaria include malleus and incus so calvaria is actually the skull cap Okay, it is the roof of the skull. It includes the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, the temporal and the greater wing of sphenoid bones. All right. It does not include the malleus incus and stapes, which are the middle ear ossicles. Next question. Lymphatics are absent in all except. So now lymph capillaries are found in all regions of the body except the bone marrow. The central nervous system which includes the brain and the spinal cord and tissues like epidermis cornea and cartilage that lack blood vessels so brain bone marrow cornea don't have lymphatics spleen has in fact spleen is a secondary lymphoid organ itself now the last question of this section what is the first part of the vertebral artery related to the superior cervical ganglion, the middle or uh, cervical ganglion, the stellate ganglion or the ciliary ganglion. The answer is the stellate ganglion. Now you see the vertebral artery arises from the subclavian artery and it is a long artery so it is divided into four segments. From the place it arises from the subclavian artery to the, uh, uh, the transverse foramen of the sixth cervical uh, transfer uh, of the cervical vertebra okay this region from here to here all right so in this part you only see the stellate ganglion okay so the answer is stellate ganglion as it moves upward the second part is related to the middle cervical ganglion and then further up is the superior cervical ganglion anatomy doubts some more of them let's cover in this ppt First question, in relation to the occlusal plane, following muscles are in the descending order. So from the occlusal plane, the muscles that are closer to the occlusal plane will be first and then um, the ones that are farther away from the occlusal plane will come later. That's the descending order. These are the groups of muscles. First is hyoglossus, genioglossus, tyloglossus. Let's see these positions in this image. You see... The first muscle, styloglossus is coming the, on the topmost, then is coming the hyoglossus, then is coming the genioglossus and in the uh, end is the anterior belly of the digastric, next to it is the geniohyoid. Now the next question is activation of which of the following muscles are required to smile, zygomaticus major, zygomaticus minor, depressor anguli oris, orbicularis oris or rhizorius. The answer is actually uh, B, major, minor and rhizorius. 
So let's see. The facial muscles involved in smiling are levator labii superioris. Here it lies, levator labii superioris. It raises and pushes the upper lip out. Next is zygomaticus minor, this one, which will push the upper lip, uh, raise the upper lip. Zygomaticus major, which will cool, pull the corner of the mouth out and up. And lastly, the rhizorius, which will pull the corner of the mouth outward. So this is the rhizorius and it will pull the uh, corner of the mouth outwards. That's the answer. Which of the following sinuses grows till early adulthood? So the answer is maxillary and ethmoid sinuses. They are re present radiologically at birth and they continue to develop until early adulthood. The sphenoid sinus, it starts growing quite late between 3 to 7 years and the frontal sinus grows the latest between 6 to 8 years. So the frontal sinuses are the last to significantly develop. Which artery runs the lower uh, runs along the lower border of posterior belly of digastric muscle? This muscle is the posterior belly of the digastric. Uh, near the anterior, uh, sorry, uh, uh, upper border of it runs the posterior auricular artery, and near the lower border of the muscle uh, runs the occipital artery. Both these arteries are branches of the external carotid artery. You see, in between here will be the uh, posterior belly of the digastric, lower border parallel to the lower border is occipital artery and parallel to the upper border is the posterior auricular artery. It's an important landmark question. Meckel's cartilage extends from, the answer is from the otic capsule to the uh, symphysis area. Alright, now the otic capsule is in the middle ear region. So the, uh, the student was confused whether it should be from the middle ear to the mandible or middle ear, uh, you know, the, so the otic capsule lies in the middle ear and that's why it's the same from the middle ear or the otic capsule all the way to the symphysis of the mandible is the extent of the Meckel's cartilage. Tendon of gracilis sartorius and semitendinous muscle insert onto the tibia to form pes encerinus. Similar structure is seen in the parotid. The answer is parotid. Pes encerinus means goose feet. You know how these feet are looking, one, two, three, like that. So in the tibia, these three muscles, they, uh, you know, they are diverging and looking like the feet of the goose. That's why it's called pes encerin versa. Similar structure is seen when the uh, facial nerve divides the uh, in the substance of the parotid into superficial and deep parotid. It divides uh, into all its superficial uh, branches. So there is this uh, upper, the middle and the lower branches and this area again looks like the goose feet, pes and serenus. So the answer is parotid gland. Now, the next question is, which of the following arteries does not supply the circle of Venus, villus? Circle of villus is the anastomatic ring of arteries that is located at the base of the uh, brain. This much only is the circle of villus, not this, okay, only this much. So, it comprises of the anterior communicating artery, the anterior cerebral arteries, the internal carotid and the middle cerebral artery, the posterior uh, cerebral artery and the posterior communicating artery. So this thing is the circle of villus. All right. Now here the posterior inferior cerebellar it should be actually. Uh, the spelling mistake is there. Posterior inferior cerebellar artery is actually a branch of the vertebral artery and it is over here. So this is not a part of the circle of villus. Now, infection spreading via lymphatics from the lower lip first enters the blood stream at. Now, the lymphatics, you know, there are two major lymphatic uh, uh, 
like drainages one from this blue side it uh, blue like you know from the right side it drains into the right lymphatic duct over here and all this area the rest of the yellow area it drains into the uh, thoracic duct now there is a place where the uh, lymphatics will finally drain into the venous system so here on the now the lower lip will come here and from the lower lip the blood supply will go to the thoracic duct ultimately and from the thoracic duct it will uh, drain into the left brachiocephalic vein which is formed at the union of the uh, subclavian uh, vein and the internal jugular vein okay so the answer is brachiocephalic vein which structure pierces the buccinator muscle and what is the nerve supply of the buccinator muscle so this is a very good doubt because it's very confusing uh, the buccinator muscle actually is supplied by the facial nerve but it is pierced by the long buccal nerve which is a branch of the mandibular nerve okay the this is the buccinator muscle it takes attachment from the uh, maxillary and mandibular alveolar bones okay and then it uh, inserts into the modiolus right now uh, superficially it is uh, you know traversed by the parotid duct and then when the parotid duct turns into the oral cavity it pierces the buccinator muscle to reach the uh, you know the buccal vestibule opposite the maxillary second molar so that's where it pierces it okay so one is the stenson's duct the other structure we'll see here uh is the uh, this nerve okay this nerve is the long buccal nerve also called only buccal nerve but this is a sensory nerve so it is not going to be giving the motor supply to the buccinator muscle because it's a sensory nerve and it is a branch of the uh, anterior division of the mandibular nerve this is the mandibular nerve you know it has these branches lingual nerve inferior alveolar nerve so this anterior branch is the uh one that uh, will pierce the buccinator muscle but it does not supply the buccinator muscle okay the supply of the buccinator muscle which is from the second uh, muscle of the second pharyngeal arch is the facial nerve if the origin of the masseter muscle is more medial on the zygomatic arch the space in the distobuccal area the answer is decreases let's see how okay now the masseter muscle has you know uh, like three layers the superficial layer which takes attachment along the zygomatic arch and there's a middle layer and then there's a deep layer which takes attachment uh, at the rear over here at the rear of the zygomatic arch okay this is here now this buccin uh, sorry this masseter muscle is uh, you know lying outside the buccinator muscle which lies here okay over here on the alveolar bone of the upper and the lower here lies like a c uh, the buccinator muscle so the masseter muscle especially the deeper layer of the masseter muscle is you know if you see in the cross section is going to be compressing on to the buccinator muscle right so uh, now they are asking about the distobuccal area so this area you know retromolar pad area and this area is the distobuccal area this entire thing from the say the frenum area all the way to the retromolar pad area is the buccal vestibule and the distal most part of it here near the retromolar pad area is the distobuccal area so when we have the origin of this muscle the deeper layer more medially that means that it is going to compress onto the buccinator even more and this space will be limited that is why the more medial the attachment of the masseter the smaller the distobuccal space will be and that is why during border molding we have this you know when we do the lower uh, denture there is a depression over here of the masseter muscle inner layer of the masseter deeper layer of the masseter muscle on to the buccinator and uh, in the form of the masseteric notch So this was our last question hope this helps answer all your doubts